the European sports market is about to experience a tidal wave of welcome change in relation to how its sport federations and associations lay out their rules to pay and play in Europe sports competitions. From the right to set up a Super League in European football, and also a new organizer of skating competitions other than the International Skating Union, to the right for players who are not homegrown players to be included in European tournaments, the European Union Court of Justice has changed the rules of a sports game via its three judgments handed down on 21st of December 2023. During the Paris Arbitration Week 2022, the topic of competition law in sports came up, and to my awareness, at the accuracy event on the 29th of March 2022. For the first time, I was made aware that both the French Competition Authority, Autorité de la Concurrence, and the European Union authorities are determined to make sports federations and structures way more accountable for their anti-competitive behaviors and abuses of dominant position. While the talk on sports and competition law at the accuracy webinar was fuzzy and incomplete at best, it did stay with me as a topic worth investigating further, since sports is an economic activity and as such must comply with, in particular, the provisions of Article 101 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, the TFEU, the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, TFEU. This uh, um, Article 101 relates to the prohibition of agreements having for object or effect the prevention, restrictions, or distortion of competition within the EU internal market. And even sports federations and uh, associations must walk the line and comply with Article 101 of the TFU in particular. So it was a great and welcome surprise when at the end of 2023, I heard that the European Union Court of Justice, the EUCJ, had handed down not one, but three judgments on the same day, clearly delineating behaviors and regulations from sports federations, which were not okay, and even forbidden from a competition law standpoint. Let's dive in, shall we? The European Union Court of Justice gives green light to the Football Super League, and this is the topic of the first decision. The most important and longest, by a wide margin, judgment handed down by the European Union Court of Justice on the 21st of December 2023 was European Super League Company SL versus Fédération Internationale de Football Association, FIFA, and Union of European Football Associations, UEFA. So what are the facts? Well, as explained in my seminal article on women's football, so if you want to have a look at all these articles or, or uh, organizations I refer to in, uh, in this webinar, we have a written version of this content in English on crefovie.com and in French on uh, crefovie.fr. And um, on there, you can um, uh, take a subscription to have a view, of, a view at our content, and you have access to all the links which refer you to all these uh, various references I'm, I'm making right, right now already during this webinar. So as explained in my seminal article on women's football, FIFA is a top international governing body of association football in the world. UEFA is one of the six continental bodies of governance in association football focused on the European continent, of course. Both FIFA and UEFA are associations governed by private law having their headquarters in Switzerland for tax reasons, of course. So Article 2 of the FIFA statutes sets out that FIFA's objectives include Interalia to organize its own international competitions, to draw up regulations and provisions governing the game of football and related matters, and to ensure their enforcement. Also to control 
every type of association football by taking appropriate steps to prevent infringements of the FIFA statutes, regulations, or decisions of FIFA or of the laws of a game at the world level. UEFA, as one of the six continental confederations recognized by FIFA, undertakes to comply with the FIFA statutes, regulations, directives, and decisions of FIFA for Europe, its territory. And any association which is responsible for organizing and supervising football in a given European country may become a member of FIFA, provided that it is already a member of UEFA, of course, and that it also undertakes beforehand to comply with the FIFA statutes, regulations, directives, and decisions of FIFA. So such national football associations, which are currently members of FIFA, have the obligation to cause their own members and affiliates to comply with the FIFA statutes and decisions of FIFA and regulations and directives, etc., and to ensure that these members or affiliates are served as well these rules by all stakeholders in association football, in particular by the professional leagues, the clubs, and the players. So it's a very top-down approach, super hierarchical, like a pyramid, really. So Article 22 of the FIFA statutes uh, um, provides that each confederation, including EUFA, of course, shall have the following rights and obligations to ensure that international leagues or any other such groups of clubs or leagues shall not be formed without its consent and the approval of FIFA. So to create a new league, you need to have the approval of FIFA. And also Article 67 of the FIFA Statute set out that FIFA and its member associations and confederations are the original owners of all the rights emanating from competitions and other events coming under the respective jurisdiction without any restrictions as to content, time, place, and law. And these rights include, among others, every kind of financial rights, audiovisual and radio recording, reproduction, broadcasting rights, multimedia rights, marketing and promotional rights, and incorporeal rights, such as emblems and rights arising under copyright law. And the council, which is the, the council, which is the strategic and oversight body of FIFA, shall decide how and to what extent those rights are utilized and draw up special regulations to be sent. The council shall decide alone whether these rights will be utilized exclusively or jointly with a third party or entirely through a third party. Okay, and so Article 68 of the uh, FIFA Statutes provides that FIFA is a member of its associations and the confederations are exclusively responsible for authorizing the distribution of images and sound and other data uh, carriers of football matches and events coming under their respective jurisdiction without any restrictions as to content, time, place, and technical and legal aspects. So similarly, the UEFA statutes grants monopolistic rights to the UEFA in terms of consenting to the formation of clubs and leagues in Europe, earning the rights emanating from football competitions, in particular broadcasting rights in Europe, and of having the sole jurisdiction to organize or abolish international competitions in Europe in which member associations or clubs participate. So today, 59 national football associations are currently members of UEFA. Now that we have set up the legal framework scene, so to speak, let's have a look at why the European Union Court of Justice had to take a decision relating to the FIFA statutes and UEFA statutes. Well, uh, it so happens that at the uh, initiative of a group of professional football clubs um, established in Spain, so Club Atletico de Madrid, Football Club Barcelona and Real Madrid, Club de Football, in Italy, Associazione Calcio Milan, Football Club Internazionale Milano, and Juventus Football Club. And in the United Kingdom, Arsenal Football Club, Chelsea Football Club, Liverpool Football Club, Manchester City Football Club, Manchester United Football Club, and Tottenham Hotspur Football Club have established the European Super League company, which was incorporated in Spain, and that's the Super League. So to execute the Super League project, it was planned to incorporate three other companies tasked with the management of the Super League from a financial, sporting and disciplinary perspective, the exploitation of the media rights relating to that competition, and also the exploitation of the other commercial assets related to that competition. 
So the Super League project was based on a shareholder and investment agreement provided, providing for the conclusion of a set of contracts binding each of the professional football clubs participating or eligible to participate in the Super League. And the three above mentioned, previously mentioned companies to be established, having as their object to set out the detailed rules under which those clubs were to assign to the Super League their median commercial rights to that competition and the remuneration for that assignment of rights. Among other things, the, that shareholder and investment agreement made it a suspensive condition to obtain either the recognition of a Super League international competition by FIFA or EUFA and confirmation of its compliance with the FIFA statutes and the, the EUFA statutes, or the legal protection from the competent administrative or judicial authorities to enable the professional football clubs having the status of permanent members to participate in the Super League without that affecting the memberships of and participation in the national football associations, professional leagues, or international competitions in which they have been involved. So they wanted to keep their current relationship and status with FIFA and UEFA, in particular being able to still play into the FIFA World Cup, UEFA uh, Cups, but at the same time, they also wanted to take part in this Super League project. So to that effect, that shareholder and investment agreement provided that FIFA and UEFA were to be informed of the Super League project. Predictably, FIFA and UEFA were not amused and not impressed when they were made aware of a Super League project, therefore blocking any ability to move forward such Super League project. So what happened from a procedural standpoint from then on? Well, the main proceedings have arisen out of a commercial action, including a petition for protective measures without an interpartis hearing brought by the Super League before the Spanish Juzgado de la Mercantial de Madrid against FIFA and UEFA. That legal action was brought following the launch of a Super League project and FIFA's and UEFA's opposition to that project, as already mentioned. Consequently, the Juzgado de la Comercial de Madrid decided to stay the proceedings and to refer the following questions to the European Union Court of Justice for a preliminary ruling. First question. Must Article 102 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union, the TFEU, so Article 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, TFEU, which relates to abuse of dominant position, be interpreted as meaning that such article prohibits the abuse of a dominant position consisting of the stipulations by FIFA and UEFA in the statute that the prior approval of those entities which have conferred on themselves the exclusive power to organize or give permission for international club competitions in Europe is required in order for a third party entity to set up a new pan European club competition like the Super League, in particular, where no regulated procedure based on objective, transparent, and non discriminatory criteria exists, and taking into account the possible conflict of interest affecting FIFA and UFA. Okay, so it's a very convoluted way of saying is it a breach under EU competition law and under Article 102 of the TFOU? to require the permission from FIFA and UEFA to set up the Super League project, knowing that there aren't any regulated procedure based on objective, transparent, and non-discriminatory criteria to grant such, such, um, such permission, and also knowing that FIFA and uh, UEFA may have a conflict of interest with the Super League project. First question, then. Second question was, must Article 101 of the TFEU, which relates to breach of competition, be interpreted as meaning that such article prohibits FIFA and UEFA from requiring in the statute that prior approval of those entities which have conferred on themselves the exclusive power to organize or give permission for intellectual competitions in Europe in order for a third party entity to create a new pan-European club competition, like the Super League, in particular, 
where no regulated procedure based on objective, transparent, and non-discriminatory criteria exists and taking into account the possible conflict of interest affecting FIFA and UEFA. Okay, so this is another quite convoluted way of saying, is there a breach of EU competition law under Article 101 of the TFEU? The, the fact that the statutes of FIFA and UEFA make it compulsory to get the prior year approval of FIFA and UEFA before being able to set up the Super League project. So is it a breach of competition? Then the third question, number three, was whether article, must articles 101 and 102 of the TFEU be interpreted as meaning that those articles prohibit conduct by FIFA, UEFA, their member associations and or in national leagues, which consists of a threat to adopt sanctions against clubs participating in the Super League and or their players, owing to the deterrent effect that those sanctions may create if sanctions are adopted, involving exclusions from competitions on, or a ban on participating in national team matches, would those sanctions, if they were not based on objective, transparent and non-discriminatory criteria, constitute an infringement of Articles 101 or 102 of the TFEU? So this third question relates to whether there is a breach of EU competition law because the statutes of FIFA and UEFA provide that some sanctions could be taken against the clubs and players who participate in the Super League project. And are these sanctions uh, anti-competitive? And uh, in particular, whether there is a ban, is that all anti-competitive under Articles 101 and 102 of the TFEU? Question number four. Must Articles 101 and 102 of a, a TFEU be interpreted as meaning that the provisions of Articles 67 and 68 of FIFA statutes are incompatible with those articles insofar as they identify UEFA and its national member associations as original owners of full of the rights emanating from competitions coming under their respective jurisdiction, thereby depriving participating clubs and any organizer of an alternative competition of the original ownership of those rights and arrogating to themselves sole responsibility for the marketing of those rights. So is there a breach of EU competition law because the UEFA and FIFA have a monopolistic right over the broadcasting and financial rights relating to these competitions? And the fifth question asked by uh, the Super League project to the European Union Court of Justice is if FIFA and UEFA as entities which have conferred on themselves the exclusive power to organize and give permissions to international club football or competitions in Europe were to prohibit or prevent the development of a Super League on the basis of the previously mentioned provisions of the statute, would Article 101 of the TFEU have to be interpreted as meaning that those restrictions on competition qualify for the exception laid down therein? regarding being had to the fact that production is substantially limited, the appearance on the market products other than those offered by FIFA UFA is impeded, and innovation is restricted since other formats and types are precluded, thereby eliminating potential competition on the market and limiting consumer choice. Would that restriction be covered by an objective justification, which would permit the view that there is no abuse of a dominant position for the purposes of Article 102 TFEU. So here the question is, are these restrictions anti-competitive because they basically stiffen and even prohibit any competition whatsoever in the football sector in Europe? And is there any exception and any justification to such restriction that could therefore remove, waive any breach of and abuse of the dominant position? The sixth question and last one, which was asked is, must articles 45, which is about the freedom of movement for workers, article 49 about the freedom of establishment of EU nationals, article 56 about the freedom to provide services, and article 63 about the freedom on the movement of capital of the TFEU be interpreted as meaning that requiring the prior approval of FIFA and UEFA for the establishment by an economic operator of a new member state of a pan-European club competition like the Super League, a provision of a kind contained in the FIFA and UEFA statutes constitutes a restriction contrary to one or more of the fundamental freedoms recognized in those articles. 
So basically, the sixth question is, is there a breach to the EU rights relating to freedom of movement of workers, of capital, and of services, and a freedom, a, a breach to the freedom of establishment of EU nationals, because this Super League project cannot go through because of the uh, refusal by FIFA and UFA to let it happen. Right, we're done with all the six questions which were asked to the European Union Court of Justice. So, the key legal takeaways is that there is an abuse of dominant position and also a breach of competition and also a breach of the freedom to provide services and none of those breaches of EU competition law are justified by any waiver, okay? They, they can't be waived or justified. How did the EUCJ come to this conclusion? Well, after an extremely conservative, partial and short-sighted opinion handed down by the EUCJ's Advocate General, Rantos, Mr. Rantos, on the 15th of December 2022, the European Union Court of Justice saw the light and handed down one year later the following judgment on the 31st of December 2023. The practice for sports, and in particular the exploitation of broadcasting rights, constitutes an economic activity and is therefore subject to the provisions of EU law applicable to such activity, says the European Court of Justice. The rules adopted by sporting associations come within the scope of the TFEU and in particular EU competition law provisions set out in the TFEU. Article 101 TFEU and Article 102 TFEU are applicable to entities which are established in the form of associations, which have as a purpose the organization and control of a given sport, as well as to associations of undertakings such as FIFA and UEFA. FIFA and UEFA both carry on economic activity consisting in the organization and marketing of international football competitions and the exploitation of the various rights related to these competitions. Thus, insofar as they do so, FIFA and UEFA are both undertakings. They both also hold a dominant position, even a monopoly on the relevant market, which is the European sports market for football. FIFA and UEFA have granted themselves regulatory and control powers, and those rules confer on those two entities not only the power to authorize the setting up an organization by a third party undertaking of a new interclub football competition on EU territory, but also the power to control the participation of professional football clubs and players in such a competition on pain of sanctions. Those various powers of FIFA and UEFA are not placed within a framework of either substantive criteria or detailed procedural rules suitable for ensuring that they are transparent, objective, and non-discriminatory. There is therefore an abuse of dominant position pursuant to Article 102 of the TFEU. FIFA and UEFA have adopted and implemented rules which are making subject to their prior approval the setting up on EU territory of a new interclub football competition by the third party undertaking, such as the Super League project, and controlling the participation of professional football clubs and players in such a competition on pain of sanctions, where there is no framework for those various powers providing for substantive criteria and detailed procedural rules suitable for ensuring that they are transparent objective, non-discriminatory, and proportionate. These rules constitute a decision by an association of undertakings having as its object the prevention of competition in breach of Article 101 of the TFEU. The conduct of FIFA and UEFA cannot be justified by an exemption pursuant to Article 101, Paragraph 3 of the TFEU or other provisions of the TFEU. And the FIFA and UEFA rules are also in breach of Article 56 of the TFEU, as there are an obstacle to freedom to provide services, limiting access to any newcomer. Such rules are not justified by a legitimate objective in the public interest and do not provide for substantive criteria and detailed procedural rules suitable for ensuring that they are transparent, objective, non-discriminatory, and proportionate. Therefore, the FIFA statutes and the UEFA statutes on prior approval of interclub competition in football, such as the Super League, are contrary to EU law. While that judgment does not mean that the Super League project must necessarily be approved, 
It is, however, for the commercial court in Madrid to ascertain whether these abusive FIFA and UEFA rules and statutes might nevertheless benefit different stakeholders in, in football, for example, by ensuring a solidarity-like distribution of the profits generated by those rights. And now the floodgates are open and the Super League project can finally move forward in Europe, further to this decision from the European Union Court of Justice. Now, case number two and judgment number two, which was handed down by the Court of Justice, the EU Court of Justice, on the 21st of December, 2023 where the EUCJ found that the International Skating Union rules also breach antitrust law. So this was the most, second most important judgment handed down by the European Union Court of Justice on the 21st of December 2023, and it's called International Skating Union ICU versus European Commission and others. What are the facts? Well, the ICU is also an association governed by private law, which is headquartered in Switzerland, also for tax purposes. It describes itself as the only international sports federation recognized by the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, in the field of figure skating and speed skating. The members of ICU are skating national associations whose members or affiliates are in turn associations and clubs to which, in particular, professional athletes practicing those sports disciplines as an economic activity belong. So Article 101 and Article 31 of the ICU Statutes provide that the aim of the ICU is to regulate, administer, govern, and promote skating throughout the world. At the same time, the ICU carry, carries out an economic activity consisting in particular of organizing international skating events and exploiting the rights associated with those events. The International Skating Union, the ICU, has set up some prior authorization rules which set out the procedure to follow in order to obtain advance authorization to organize an international skating competition. These prior authorization rules apply to both national associations that are ICU members and any third party entity or undertaking. Also, the ICU has set up some eligibility rules which determine the conditions in which athletes may take part in skating competitions. Those eligibility rules provide that such competitions must first have been authorized by the ICU or its members, and second, comply with the rules established by the ICU. Mr. Twittert and Mr. Kerstolt, two professional speed skaters residing in the Netherlands, belonging to the Koninklijke Neerschrijnsders Bond, KNSB, the Royal Netherlands Skating Federation, which is a member of the ICU, submitted a complaint to the European Commission in which they claimed that the prior authorization rules and eligibility rules laid down by the ICU infringed Articles 101 and 102 of the TFEU. On the 8th of December 2017, the European Commission adopted the decision at issue, which considered that the ICU is an association of undertakings, like FIFA and like UEFA. And the prior authorization rules and eligibility rules were decisions of associations of undertakings like the FIFA Statute and the UFA Statutes, within the meaning of Article 101, Paragraph 1 of the TFEU. The European Commission decision also considered that the EICU prior authorization rules and um, eligibility rules had as their object a restriction of competition on the relevant market, as they prevented potential organizers of international skating events in competition with ICU events from entering that market and also restricted the possibility for professional skaters to take part freely in those events. The European Commission decision further considered that such ICU rules were not justified by legitimate objectives and inherent in the pursuit of those objectives, 
nor do the ICO rules benefit from any exemption pursuant to Article 101, Paragraph 3 of the TFEU. So the European Commission decision requested that the ICU bring the infringement established in that decision to an end on pain of periodic penalty payments. Such measures that it required the ICU to take to bring an end to that infringement should in particular consist of first adopting prior authorization criteria, which are objective, transparent, non-discriminatory, and proportionate, and second, setting up suitable procedures for prior authorization and sanctions, and third, amending the arbitration rules so as to ensure the effective review of decisions made at the end of those procedures. By application lodged at the Registry of the General Court of the EU in February 2018, the ICU brought an appeal action for annulment of the European Commission decision, predictably. On the 16th of December 2020, the European Union General Court handed down a judgment under appeal in which it held in a sense that the European Commission decision was not vitiated by illegality insofar as it related to the ICU's prior authorization rules and eligibility rules, but that the European Commission decision was unlawful insofar as it related to the ICU arbitration rules. The ICU appealed to the European Union Court of Justice claiming that it should set aside the judgment under appeal insofar as it dismissed in part the action at first instance, annul the European Commission decision to the extent that it had not already been annulled by the judgment under appeal, and order the European Commission and interveners at first instance to pay the cost incurred both at first instance and on appeal. So what are the key findings that the European Court of Justice has made in its second judgment handed down on the 21st of December 2023? Well, in a nutshell, the key legal findings are Indeed, ICU abuses its dominant position, it restricts competition law, and the ICU arbitration rules breach EU competition law. In this, in a nutshell, is what the European Commission Court of Justice has found. After a rather useless, completely conservative and very partial opinion from the European Union Court of Justice Advocate General Rantus, the European Union Court of Justice decided that the practice of sports constitutes an economic activity and as such is subject to the provisions of EU law applicable to such activity, in particular EU competition law and over TFEU. Therefore, skating is subject to EU competition law. ICO rules have as their object and or effect the prevention, restriction or distortion of competition within the meaning of Article 101 paragraph one of the TFEU. In so doing, the ICU rules prevent the growth of competition in the skating sector to the detriment of consumers by limiting production, product or alternative service development or innovation. Moreover, the ICU rules, which do not prevent the risk of abuse of dominant position, confer a power to ICU, an undertaking in a dominant position, infringe Article 102 of the TFEU. The ICO rules are able to be used to allow or exclude from the skating market any competing undertaking, even an equally efficient undertaking, or at least restricts the creation and marketing of alternative or new competitions in terms of a format or content. In so doing, the ICO rules also completely deprive athletes of the opportunity to participate in those competitions. Even, when, even where they could be of interest to them. For example, on account of an innovative format, while observing all the principles, values, and rules underpinning the sporting discipline it concerned. Ultimately, the ICO rules are such as to completely deprive spectators and viewers of any opportunity to attend those competitions or to watch a broadcast of, of these new competitions. Consequently, the first ground of appeal must be rejected, says the European Court of Justice. The ICU prior authorization rules and eligibility rules had at the object restriction of competition. Such ICU rules must be subject to a framework so as to ensure that they are transparent, objective, 
non-discriminatory and proportionate. Consequently, the second ground of appeal must be rejected too. The exclusive and mandatory arbitration mechanisms provided for by the ICU rules are not a generally accepted method of resolving dispute and cannot be justified in the light of the need to ensure the uniform and effective application of the rules established by the ICU for all athletes practicing skating. The ICU arbitration rules reinforced the infringement of EU law connected with the existence of such powers because that judicial review was entrusted to a court established in a third country, i.e. the Court of Arbitration for Sports, which is based in Switzerland, therefore outside the European Union, and its legal order. And that according to the case law of CAS, of the Court of Arbitration for Sport, CAS, such arbitration awards could not be reviewed in the light of EU competition rules, in particular Articles 101 and 102 of the TFEU. This situation afforded legal immunity to ICU in light of EU competition law in the exercise of its decision-making and sanctioning powers to the detriment of persons who may be affected by the lack of a framework for those powers and the discretionary nature which derives uh, therefrom. The ICU cannot, in doing so, limit the exercise of rights and freedoms conferred on individuals by EU law, which includes the rights to that underlie Article 101 and 102 of the TFU. Thus, the EU General Court erred in law by merrily finding that the ICU arbitration rules must be justified by legitimate interests linked to the specific nature of a sport. And the first ground of appeal raised by the European Commission, Mr. Twittert and Mr. Gestalt, is therefore well found in its entirety. Consequently, the judgment under appeal must be set aside insofar as it annulled in part the European Commission decision to the extent that the European Commission decision concerns the EIC arbitration rules. So let me explain to you the last point um, in relation to the uh, arbitration rules. What the European Union Court of Justice is saying is, well, the ICR rules in relation to arbitration say that only the Court of Arbitration for Sports, which is based in Switzerland, which is a country which is outside the European Union, is competent for to decide any disputes relating to skating and the ICU competitions and um, and, and rules, etc. And the Court of Arbitration for Sports, being outside the European Union, does not have to comply and apply European Union competition laws, such as Article 101 and 102 of the TFEU. And therefore, this would give um, the ICU, based in Switzerland, a pass, a, a legal immunity, because none of its rules have to comply with EU competition law, since the CAS is never going to apply EU competition law in the first instance anyway. And therefore, the EU Court of Justice says no, the ICU arbitration rules, which automatically select CAS as the sole arbitration institution in charge of all ICU uh, disputes, is a breach of EU competition law. So really, the European Commission and um, the two uh, Dutch skaters came out extremely victorious from this legal case. If well, third party skating competitions are going to be allowed from now on in the world, or at least in the EU, because ICU cannot have a monopoly. And now let's have a look at the third case and judgment, which was handed down on the 21st of December 2023. This one is a bit more minor. It also relates to football association rules. And it relates to the UEFA, again, so the body which is in charge of Europe for in, in the football sphere, and also the Belgian, the Belgian uh, Football Association rules. This judgment handed down by the European Union Court of Justice on the 21st of December 2023 provided that professional football clubs participating in international interclub football competitions organized by UEFA must include a maximum number of 25 players on the match sheet, which itself must include a minimum number of players categorized as homegrown players, HGP, homegrown players. 
And HGP homegrown players are players who, regardless of a nationality, have been trained by their club or by a club affiliated to the same national football association for at least three years between the ages of 15 and 21. And so the European Court of Justice said those HGP rules uh, may be in breach of EU competition law. And more specifically, the European Union Court of Justice finds that the Belgian referring court must check whether the homegrown player rules have as their objective or effect a restriction, prevention or distortion of competition in breach of Article 101 of the TFEU. Also, the Belgian referring court must check whether these homegrown player rules may benefit from an exemption to the application of Article 101, Paragraph 1 of the TFEU, if it is demonstrated through convincing arguments and evidence that all of the conditions required for that purpose are satisfied in compliance with Article 101, Paragraph 3 of the TFEU. Also, the Belgian referring court must check whether these HGP rules are in breach of Article 45 of the TFEU, which relates to the free movement of, of workers, because they require each club participating in football competitions to enter in the list of its players and to include on the match sheet a minimum number of players trained in the territorial jurisdiction of EUFA, unless it is established that the HGP rules are suitable for ensuring in a consistent and systematic manner the attainment of the objectives of encouraging at a local level the recruitment and training of young professional football players in that they do not go beyond what is necessary to achieve that objective. So in this third, and as I said, more minor judgment handed down by the European Union Court of Justice on the 21st of December, 2023, the Court of Justice says to the Belgium court, it is now for you to decide and to assess whether there is a restriction and prevention of uh, or distortion of competition in breach of Article 101 under the homegrown play rules which are in, inside the uh, UFA rules and uh, and Belgium football rules. And uh, you need also to check whether there is any exemption possible under Article 101, Paragraph 3 of the TFEU. And also you need to check whether there is a breach of um, the in relation to the freedom of movement of workers. Because if uh, one player has to work for three years and to train for three years between ages 15 and 21, to be considered to be a homegrown player, that's pretty restrictive. Now, national courts in the European Union member states have a framework to assess whether the rules of the sports federations and associations located on their ground or in Switzerland, such as FIFA, UEFA and ICU, breach EU competition law, in particular as far as restriction of competition, abuse of dominant position and restriction to the freedom of movement of workers, and or uh, to the freedom of providing services are concerned. The floodgates are now open and I expect a lot of litigation going on in the next five years in the sports industry from clubs and players to keep federations and associations on their toes and force them to change their monopolistic and autocratic way. So there's going to be a lot of change in the European sports sector and I really look forward to that. Thank you so much for attending and I'll catch up with you very soon. Bye for now.